Hi, my name's Father Augustine Weta. I'm a monk of St. Louis Abbey, and welcome to the first episode of Portsmouth Institute's Benedictine Coronavirus Retreat, uh, which we have chosen to call Crisis Converted, a Benedictine Guide to Hope. Uh, we're going to have five of these episodes, and each one of them is going to focus on a different aspect of Benedictine spirituality. I'm going to start with the first three vows, well, the only three vows that Benedictines take, and then two characteristics of our spirituality. Uh, we're going to start with stability, then obedience, conversion, silence, and last of all, death. More on that later, uh, whether you like it or not. Um, in a certain sense, we're all monks now, whether we like it or not. We've all become Benedictines, whether we like it or not. In fact, a lot of what we're doing right now, we're doing whether we like it or not. I think many of us would much rather go off and do other more important things than we're doing right now. Uh, but we're forced now to re-examine our lives and to take a much smaller view of ourselves, perhaps, of the church, and of the reality in which we live. Uh, I was off in Bentonville, Arkansas not long ago, and I was being driven from the airport to this wonderful school, that a brand new Catholic school, to talk about Homer and monasticism. And um, on the way there, the man who was driving me from the airport, he, he looked over at me and he said, you know, I had a vision not long ago. And for the record, Benedictines are not fond of visions. We don't have visions. We tend to leave that to uh, Passionists and Franciscans and Carmelites and certain children. Uh, so I... Uh, politely nodded and smiled, but inwardly died at the thought of having to sit through this. Nonetheless, Mr. Matt Abide went on with his vision. He said he was in the Garden of the Apocalypse, and he uh, the, the dragon appeared. So he grabbed a flaming sword and went running toward the dragon. And as he was just about to get to the dragon, St. Peter stepped out and said, give me that, and took the sword away from him and handed him a pair of pruning shears and said, go, go, go trim the bushes in the garden. I'll take care of the dragon. <laughs> now, like I said, I'm not a big fan of visions, but I really love this one. And I think it speaks to something at the heart of Benedictine spirituality, namely that we don't go off running uh, to fight dragons. We leave that to St. Peter, uh, to, to adventurous types. What Benedictines do is we stay put. We stay in our monastery, in our cloister, and we do our job. Uh, and, and I think whether we like it or not now, um, uh, that, and I, I'm sorry to say that phrase is going to keep coming up throughout this retreat. <laughs> um, we... we we, have, we are forced to tend our own little gardens. Um, so by way of introduction, I want to talk about that. Um, the purpose of the monk's vow of stability is, as it were, to create a heaven on earth. Okay? Uh, I was at the FOCUS, the annual FOCUS convention not long ago, and uh, Curtis Martin, who founded this phenomenal Catholic movement, he uh, reflected on the Gospel of Matthew, and he said, you know, Jesus didn't wait up in heaven uh, for us to come to him. He came down and got in our lives and, brought, and became part of our lives first, and then preached the Gospel. And as wonderful as this message was, I, I realized that that is exactly the opposite of what monks do. Uh, we, we create a heaven, put a wall around it, and then make it difficult to get in. Uh, and this is part of the purpose of the vow of stability. Um, while we're there, 
we say the divine office. And if you don't say the divine office, if you haven't been saying the divine office, I highly recommend now as the time to start. Um, the church is, as it were, a mountain of stability. And the way to key into that mountain, the way to hold on to it, at least with one hand, is firstly through the Eucharist, which we do not have at the moment. Well, ha, I do, but you don't. Um, and, but then secondly, through the divine office, that recitation of certain psalms at certain times during the day uh, that connects us with the broader church. Uh, and I recommend this for a number of reasons. For one thing, uh, you know, I think it's St. Augustine who said that when he started praying the Psalms, it was distressing to him because he would get up in the morning and he'd be in a really great mood and then he'd read a Psalm like, uh, my one companion is darkness, or my foes are all around me, or Lord, break the teeth in their mouths, may they wither like the snail that dissolves into slime. And he said, what was the point of this, right? Well, the point was that his spirituality shouldn't have been connected to his mood. It should have been infused with the spirituality of the greater church. Uh, so if you haven't started saying the divine office, say it now. It's a way of bringing the Eucharist out of the church and into your lives, extending it beyond its physical boundaries. And you can find this online, by the way. I think there, it, it, well, actually, if you just look up Roman Catholic Divine Office, you can find it. And, and you can hear it said out loud, uh, too. And there are a number of monasteries, including my, aunt, my own, which are broadcasting the Divine Office right now for other people to engage in and to participate in. But as you do this, what you're doing is you're bringing heaven down to earth, right? So your little cloister, wherever it is, becomes a sacred space. And that means you can't leave it. You can't just just uh, uh, move on or, 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 or find a new one. And that's why monks take this vow of stability. I was looking around, I was researching this little talk, and I found an article uh, in Slate magazine called, Monks Take a Vow of Stability, Maybe You Should Too. And it's online as well, so you can find it. It's by Gretchen Rubin, and it's from 2009. And she says, uh, she quotes Thomas Merton. She says, By making a vow of stability, the monk renounces the vain hope of wandering off to find a perfect monastery. This implies a deep act of faith, the recognition that it does not much matter where we are or whom we live with. Stability becomes difficult for a man whose monastic ideal contains some note, some element of the extraordinary. All monasteries are more or less ordinary. Its ordinariness is one of its greatest blessings. Which kind of brings us back to Matt Abide's vision, doesn't it? Uh, we live in this culture of options. And I, I find that, well, no, socio I'm writing this book on decision making at the moment. And it turns out that pretty much everybody agrees more choices does not equal greater happiness. In fact, the more choices you have going into a decision, the less content you turn out to be uh, with the decision you've made. A and by way of researching this book, I actually found this article in the New York Times, no bastion of Catholic orthodoxy, mind you, but I think they got it right on this one. This guy wrote an article called Why You Will Marry the Wrong Woman. Um, and aside from being a little bit consoling to me personally, it's also, I think, a brilliant encapsulation of this sense of stability in decision making. Um, he says, you know, there are uh, so many billion people in the world uh, you're not going to find, and what are the odds, statistically, that you're going to find the perfect match, right? Even if it exists out there, the odds that you'll ever find her are astronomically low. And yet, there are all these happily married people in the world. How does that even happen, right? He says, well, they just make a decision and stick with it. They commit, Right? And this, I think, is at the heart of the Benedictine vow of stability. That, you know, you're not going to find the perfect cloister. You're not going to find the perfect monastery. Uh, you're not going to find the perfect wife. So you might as well just commit to the one you've got. <laughs> uh, and this, I think, is why we take vows at all, ever. 
Uh, when I was in the novitiate and uh, thinking of leaving for like the 50th time, I went to visit my novice master, Father Luke, uh, Abbot Luke. He had been the, the founding abbot of our monastery. And I said, Abbot Luke, uh, I'm leaving. And he looked up from the book he was reading and he said, really, today? Uh, which caught me a little off guard. Uh, and, and I said, um, well, probably not today. So he said, well, be a good monk today and leave tomorrow. And he went back to his book. <laughs> and uh, I then sat down across from him and I said, okay, but how do I know I'm even supposed to be here today? And he said, uh, well, you're not somewhere else. Uh, we're all not somewhere else right now. Um, so I, th I've been coming back to this uh, repeatedly in my thoughts. Of course, that, that answer wasn't good enough for me, so I, I pressed him further. And finally, he took out the Bible, which is always a good thing to do when you're distressed. And he found the passage about the man born blind, who, by the way, everyone pretty much, scholars pretty much agree he must be a teenager because he's so annoying um, and, uh, and because they have to call his parents uh, to, and they say, well, he's old enough to speak for himself. Uh, but here's the thing. Jesus cures him of blindness. Right? He p p spits in some mud, sticks it on his eyes, and when he takes it off, washes it off, um, he can see. And uh, so the scribes and Pharisees, I believe, call him in after this has been done, and they say, uh, did, did a miracle happen for you? That's the bell for prayer. Can you hear it? I'll have to come back later. Sorry. So they ask him, how did you get your sight back? Uh, I don't know. He says, he stuck mud in my eyes and now I can see. But this man is a sinner, they say. Well, maybe so. I don't know. I was blind. Now I can see. But we have no idea where this guy is from. Who cares? I was blind. Now I can see. How many times do I have to tell you, says the young man. Notice that he makes no profession of faith, and after relentless interrogation, only then does he finally acknowledge that this man, Jesus, whoever he is, he must be from God. He doesn't even thank Jesus afterwards, right? Jesus has to find him. Do you believe in the Son of Man, says Jesus? Well, who's that? You're talking to him. Now, says Father Luke to me, Imagine an alternative ending to this story where the teenager says, oh, right, well, thanks for everything, but, you know, maybe it wasn't you who actually cured my blindness, right? Maybe I wasn't actually blind to begin with. Maybe this was all in my head. Maybe there was something in the mud, right? Maybe I better go think about this for a while. But remember, the kid is a pragmatist. For better or for worse, he sticks to the facts, we have an expression in the monastery to describe unhappy monks. We say, uh, that man has been looking over the wall. And this is uh, uniquely possible now with the internet and social media, where all you see is people's most pleasant, most entertained, uh, most loving pictures. Uh, so that no matter where you are, it really does look like the grass is greener on the other side. A few years ago, I made a pilgrimage of sorts to the Jersey Shore. Uh, my parents live right near where they filmed the reality series, and none of us in my family had ever actually seen it, so we looked it up and watched. Well, my mother couldn't make it through the first 30 seconds, uh, but my dad and I stayed up all night watching episode after episode. My dad kept saying, uh, we should stop, but I can't. It's like watching a car wreck. Um, and then the next day, we went down to the boardwalk to see what all the hubbub was about. And uh, to make a long story short, and at the risk of coming off as the old crotchety celibate priest, I was really saddened by what I saw. Uh, which was thousands and thousands of teenagers who were just tanned and tattooed and drunk to exhaustion. Uh, their life was so full of chaos and noise. 
Um, and, and I'm okay in a certain sense with uh, bad teenagers. I mean, uh, I lived in a, a, a dorm with eight other rugby players. Noise and mischief are, are, are part of the, the process of growing up as far as I'm concerned. But what was saddening to me was that they didn't know they were being bad. Um, they didn't know that there was an alternative out there. It, it was as though this life of excess was the ideal that they were trying desperately to live up to. Well, here we are now in our own little cloisters with our own silent gardens to cultivate that stability, which is, I think, the antidote to all this uh, temptation uh, to look beyond yourself to this other fantastic uh, world of chaos and instability that, that is simply fantasy in the end. So while people keep saying that these are uncertain times, uh, possibly uncertain, but not unstable, okay? We all know we're going to be here tomorrow, <laughs> right here. Admittedly, you may not have chosen this, but since you're going to be here anyway, let's make the most of our cloister.